If you've been carefully working on tax returns six and seven, most of this will be old hat, old information for you. So hopefully this section won't be as stressful as some of the others. So we're going to cover the rest of the itemized deductions with some background material first. First of all, it's important to remember that we do make a distinction between for and from AGI. For AGI is anything that lands up being deducted on the front page, either as one of those direct line items in the box at the bottom or indirectly through one of the schedules like the Schedule C. All of those business deductions are for AGI because you bring a single adjusted net income number over to the front of the 1040. From AGI is against or reducing adjusted gross income, and that is on the back of the 1040. So we've had three relatively new deductions this time. Um, moving expenses, alimony, we talked about it earlier, but in Thelma's return, you'll see the mechanics of Hayward actually making an alimony payment and taking a deduction as tax return. And then the one thing we've done to Thelma's Schedule C in tax return seven is we've added the home office deduction. I do not expect you to go deeply into these items other than to be able to handle the math. You've already seen questions on the moving expenses. The home office deduction will show up as we go forward through the next two sets of quizzes. The most important thing to remember about the home office deduction is that you cannot create a loss with your home office deduction. It's hard to see that on tax return seven since Thelma is making so much money and spending so little as a home office deduction. So pay attention to how the form is flowing and remember that you cannot create a loss with your home office deduction. The rest of the material we're going to be talking about are itemized deductions. They are from AGI. They are deducted on Schedule A. And remember, the taxpayer always gets the larger of itemized deductions or a standard deduction. And just a reminder about some of the other items that are deducted in that box at the bottom of the front of the 1040. Penalty on early withdrawal of savings. I just wanted to discuss a little bit because people find it confusing. Uh, this relates to certificate of deposits where it's a savings account, but you have promised the bank that you will leave the money tied up for a year, five years, whatever the term is, and they have given you a little bit better interest rate because of that guarantee. If something comes up and you have to take your money out early, the bank is going to charge you a penalty. And we know that penalties are not supposed to be deductible. This particular penalty is one of those many exceptions to the rule. It's really just a payment back of some of the interest that you earned because you weren't entitled to the better rate because you did not keep the, um, the account as long as you had said you would. So this and the interest on student loans, the government is allowing you to take them on the front of the 1040 instead of itemizing. If they had required you to itemize for these deductions, very few people would really get a benefit since only about 20% of people actually itemize deductions. So these are things that the government has decided should be available to all taxpayers as deductions, whether they itemize or not. And so they've simply moved them to the front of the form. We've been dealing with health insurance since tax return two. I did want to remind you that when a self-insured person pays for family members on that plan, they will only get the deduction for AGI if the other spouse has no other insurance coverage. So in our facts on tax return seven, I told you that for some reason, Hayward's company doesn't have health insurance. Pretty unusual situation. Uh, if they did have health insurance, even if it was more expensive than what Thelma could get, if Hayward walks away from it and goes through the wife's plan, only the wife's portion of the health insurance would be a deduction for AGI. The rest of it would have to be deducted on Schedule A, just like Mary did when she had to pay her own insurance. And then we know that half of self-employment taxes are deductible, and we've looked at retirement savings plans at a very basic level, and we're not going to go any deeper than that. Then, 
some of the deductions from AGI have reductions based on AGI. So that's why you have to calculate AGI first before you can finish up your Schedule A. Medical is reduced by 10% of AGI unless you are 65 or older. The rule prior to a couple years ago was 7.5% for everybody. And then when they needed some more money for the Affordable Health Care Act, this was one of those little tweaks they did to generate more revenue. So young folk reduced by 10% of AGI. And we older get 7.5%. Miscellaneous 2%, we've talked about casualties are reduced by 10% of AGI. We're going to deal with that as our very last topic of the semester. So when those slides come up, you know we are good to finish and you don't have to do this anymore. Unless, of course, you decide to take the corporate tax class. Charitable, there are limits there that I've told you to ignore. Only very rich people will land up with these limits. We'll talk about them very briefly when we're doing some of our in-class problems, but I will not hold you responsible for the math at all about any of that. 162, the little squiggly means we're talking about a code section called Trader Business Expenses. You saw a piece of it as we I introduced 162C against public policy. This code section allows business expenses to be deducted. Remember, you cannot take deductions unless you can find a code section that says you can. So they are generally deductible, trader business expenses. In Chapter 6, you talked a little bit about sometimes you don't get your prepayments if you don't have the right set of circumstances, even though you're cash basis taxpayer, but you'll eventually get them. They do need to be ordinary, necessary, and reasonable. And these are in the sight of the beholder. So you, the taxpayer, might think something meets all three categories. Absolutely. You might have an IRS agent that says it's not. So ordinary and necessary is focused on your particular line of business. To tow a cement truck behind, cement mixer behind you might be ordinary for certain contractors, but it's certainly not ordinary for a lawyer. And so to argue that I had to drag my cement truck mixer around would just get you left out of town. Necessary, sometimes you think something's necessary, but the IRS does not. There are certain cultures who would never start a new venture, sign a big contract without having their horoscope cast that day. And you may find that's an absolute necessity for you, but you're not going to get a tax deduction. And then once again, reasonable is in the eye of the beholder. If I took a client out for a lunch at the Watergate, which I have been told runs around a thousand bucks if you do it well, and I tried to deduct that on my tax return, the government would simply laugh me out of town. On the other hand, if you're trying to close a deal with a sheik of Arabia, that's his expectation. So if you've got a three or four million dollar job on the line with a really fancy customer, you may have more choice but to take him to the water gate and the IRS is going to be a lot more understanding about your need to spend that money under that set of circumstances. And then if you're self-employed, your deductions are for AGI. We've been dealing with Thelma since tax return 2, so that's just old, old news. If you're an employee, you saw on tax return 6 that Mary had some employee business expenses. They had to be deducted from AGI because she wasn't the starving artist or this other couple of weird categories that you saw the 2106 referenced on the front of the 1040. So she put them on her Schedule A as a miscellaneous 2% deduction because she was not reimbursed. The other time you would get a deduction is if your employer uses a non-accountable plan. So that non-accountable plan is tax jargon. If you see it, it means something to you, or it should. It means that your employer has chosen to give you some money to cover some expenses and is not asking for receipts back, hence the non-accountable. The employer gives you $1,000, say, go to New York, learn how to do this, take this class, come back and show us all what to do. But he doesn't ask you to pay, uh, bring back receipts or change. 
So if you stay at the YMCA and eat at the local 7-Elevens, you might keep a whole bunch of that money because you didn't actually spend it. And that's fine with the IRS because you're going to have $1,000 in your income. So when your employer just gives you the money and does not ask for the receipts, he is going to debit salary expense instead of a travel account and then he's going to reduce cash. So he's going to treat it as if he gave you simply more salary with an unrestricted use to it. And so if you have any deductions, you are going to have to take them on a 2106 and then reduce for any money that the, no, I guess I'm sorry, you don't have to reduce for any money the employer gave you this way because it was already in your W-2. On tax return 7, there's a slightly different situation where Hayward is being reimbursed through an accountable plan for his mileage, only he's not getting the whole amount the IRS allows. So he does have to account to his employer saying how many miles he's driven, and then the employer is giving him back, what, 20, 30 cents for every mile. The IRS deduction is larger and so Hayward needs to show on that line in the middle of the 2106 the cash reimbursement he got from his employer because this time the employer did not put it in his W-2. Instead, they debited car expense and credited cash because they were getting the information from Hayward of exactly how many miles he drove and then reimbursing him based on that account to them. And remember, miscellaneous 2% means it has to be reduced by 2% of AGI. So by definition, employee business deductions create less benefit than a self-employed deductions because not only do they have to go on Schedule A, which means you have to itemize, but you have to reduce them by 2% of your AGI. Section 212, a separate code section that allows expenses if you're engaged in the production of income. So back in the beginning of chapter six, it talked about the difference between being an entrepreneur and an investor. The actual kinds of deductions tend to be very similar, but the business purpose is different. So they're generally deductible. Once again, must be ordinary, necessary, and reasonable. The same kind of in the eye of the beholder criteria as you would have for trader business expenses. Section 212 expenses tend to come in three categories. The first is production or collection of income. Remember, one of the many, many ways I've been confusing you so far this semester is we've got earned and unearned income. Uh, earned income is you working, generating revenue by your efforts. This category is unearned income because it's not being earned by the sweat of your brow. Instead, it's generally your money working for you. So you have lent somebody some money and they are defaulting on the loan and you have to hire a lawyer to force them into payment. That would be an example of the kind of deduction you could take as a Section 212 deduction in this category. The second category is you own property that's being held for production of income and you have to take care of it, even though it might not be currently earning income. Management fees for your stock portfolio. You own some land because you knew you know the new short pump is coming right where you own property. But the state says that you've got to mow the grass. You've got to spray for mosquitoes. And being a savvy person, you carry liability insurance because you know some kid is going to walk across and fall in a hole and sue you. And so all of those kind of expenses would be currently deductible. On Schedule A, we're going to see as a miscellaneous 2% deduction. So they're getting less and less attractive. But they're deductible each year, even though you may not sell the land for 10 or 15 years. As long as you have a bona fide purpose of holding the land for investment purposes and not saving it because that's where your retirement home is going to be. So you have to be clear in your purpose. And if you were audited, the IRS would want to know for sure what your expectations were for making money to make sure that you weren't just disguising your future retirement home as a potential generator of income so you could take deductions. And then third category is anything relating to collecting 
any tax. So the IRS asks you anything. Uh, if you go out to the bookstores, you buy yourself a H&R Block, How to Do Your Taxes. You'll be sad if you do because you'll notice that a lot of it is just the Pub 17 because there is no copyright on the Pub 17. You buy tax software. You file online and spend 50 bucks to do that. All of those would be in this category. But you have to do a lot of that and other things to get a benefit because, once again, it's a miscellaneous 2% deduction. And then we have two different ways to deduct their Section 212, depending on exactly what's being involved. Rent and royalty expenses are deducted on the front of the Schedule E. So they're actually for AGI. Uh, royalties are, the most common case of royalties would be you own land and they want to dig for oil or gold. And you give them the rights and they pay you, but they also have to pay you 10 cents for every unit they bring out. That's what we mean here by royalty. When Stephen King gets royalties, those go on a Schedule C because those royalties are simply payments for having written something. And so they're earned income, not unearned income. So he pays self-employment taxes on his royalties from his books. You would not pay self-employment taxes on royalties from your gold mine. And then all rentals. We're going to see that it is not possible for a rental to be a trader business unless you have something like a hotel. So most rentals are Section 212 accounts. They're not trader businesses. It would be a very unusual rental that would be a trader business versus a Section 212 activity. And then everything else is from AGI. You'll know that that middle bullet, your taxes and interest, they go separately on the Schedule A because there are categories for all taxes, all interest expense. And then most investment related other items would be miscellaneous 2%. I have stated several times that you cannot take deductions unless you find a code section that says you can. And just to make sure people don't miss the point, there is a code section 262, which states that personal expenses are generally not deductible. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, for certain itemized deductions. Uh, and they're referred to as otherwise allowable deductions. And then they also use that exception for like the moving expense. It's not an itemized deduction, but when you move your family, that is a personal expenditure. Even though you are changing your tax home, moving your family is not considered to be a business expense. And so the tax code provides that you can take that deduction and gives you an upgrade and allows you to deduct it for AGI so that you get the benefit even if you don't itemize. So then we just have a laundry list here. Interest and charitable we have covered already. Refer back to that first set of PowerPoints if you have questions. Taxes, medical, casualties, not yet. Miscellaneous 2%. And then other miscellaneous, not subject to the 2% offset. You may notice if you look at your Schedule A, there is one more line after the miscellaneous 2%. Uh, we won't use it a lot at this point. Uh, it refers to gambling losses and certain employee business expenses that are related to people who need accommodation. So if you need a dog to come with you to work, to pick things up for you because you are immobile. If that dog is needed during business to allow you to function as an employee and generate revenue, they don't treat that as a medical expense reduced by seven and a half or 10% of AGI. They don't treat it as a normal employee business expense subject to the 2% offset. They put it down in this other miscellaneous category so that you get 100% of what you pay. Just a quick reminder that we do reduce medical by 7.5% or 10% of AGI. And the miscellaneous 2% are reduced by 2% of AGI. I always give you the checkbook figure. It's always your job to apply all reductions. And don't forget, for business entertainment, it is 50% off the top to begin with. Then you make it miscellaneous 2%. 
So you get a couple of hits there. I will always tell you, you spent X dollars feeding your client in a qualified business environment. It's your job to reduce down to the final answer, please. If you have not finished tax return seven yet, you will not have noticed that everything in the flush of her Schedule A does not add up to the amount that you actually deduct on the back of the 1040. That's because there's the same phase out adjustment for itemized deductions as there was for personal exemptions. So if you were happy to put zero down for Thelma's exemptions and never really explored the spreadsheet, it's come back to haunt you again for the itemized deductions. So high net worth individuals, and you can see the dollar amounts here, they vary by filing status. So you'll want to make sure that you pay attention to AGI. All right, these are AGI adjusted gross income numbers. Uh, then you have to go through another set of math to get to the final answer for itemized deductions for these people. So don't just put the check figure down and shrug your shoulders and go, wonder why it doesn't add up. Make sure you know where this worksheet can be found. The instructions for your 1040, which hopefully you did order from the IRS, are really important to keep with you. Bring them to class because they can help you get through all of this stuff less irritatedly if you just have the information available. The AMT is the alternative minimum tax. It was a creation of politicians relating to bad publicity, publicity generated by Ralph Nader. You may remember he was the uh, activist who did lots of very good things, like made sure that those fancy ornaments on the front of your car fold back because originally they were bolted and rigid and they were simply killing people when they ran into them, stabbing them through and through. So safety advocate uh, who happened to notice that really rich people use the tax code very efficiently. Rich people and rich corporations. Not that they're cheating, but they have the resources to hire people who can have them invest in the right kinds of income, use the right kinds of strategies that will give them the maximum type deductions on their tax returns. So when you say the tax code's unfair, politicians break into a cold sweat. And there are admittedly a lot of things about the tax code that perhaps need some adjusting. You may remember that Warren Buffett pointed out that it was kind of a shame that his tax rate was lower than that of his secretary and suggested that we do something about it. Well, starting in the 1970s, this relatively complicated set of math I'm going to run you through uh, was the government's answer to this fairness issue. So it's alternative. So it's a different one. A tax calculation generated to create at least a minimum amount of tax liability on some of those tax returns where they were having a limited liability because of they were using all the tax deductions and preference as well. Well, they could simply have taken the deductions away, but that would have been too easy, right? So you simply, when you finish calculating your regular tax, there is a form that has you add back certain identified deductions, do a new tax calculation at tax rates that are 26 and 28%, and then you get to pay the bigger tax. So what we're going to do right now is just introduce those Schedule A items that are part of the adjustments to get to alternative minimum taxable income. We've got a couple tax returns coming up where we'll delve down a little deeper into the AMT. But for now, all I want you to do is to remember the things that get added back that come from your Schedule A. And we're going to do the 6251 together in class. And then I would predict, my crystal ball says, not this week, but soon, you will have an opportunity to do the same adjustment that I'm going to show you here. So you add back 100% of your taxes. doesn't matter whether they were real estate or income taxes. They all come back. All of your miscellaneous 2% that survived the 2% come back. And then if you were the older person, 
who was deducting only 7.5% of AGI to reduce the medical, you have to reduce by another 2.5%. If you use 10% to begin with, there is no AMT adjustment. And then equity interest, what is equity? Well, that is you're borrowing up to the $100,000 on your house from the excess value you have in your house. That's the money that you can spend on anything you want and you don't have to track how the interest gets classified, but it is an AMT add back. So on Thelma and Hayward's return, I distinguished between the acquisition indebtedness and the equity interest. The acquisition indebtedness did become partially a deduction relating to the home office. The equity interest did not because they did not use that money to improve the house. If they had borrowed money to put in a new bedroom or to add a swimming pool, that would still be acquisition indebtedness. And all you'd have to worry about was the million dollar rule. And then life gets more complicated on though. You'll see in a minute because I'm pulling the forms up. You're going to write down 100% of the amount on line four and then adjust. But you may not be able to deduct the whole amount if you had the high net worth individual adjustment that I alluded to a few slides ago. So I've got a line for that and it's in brackets. And I'll talk about it again when we see the form. And then your state tax refunds that were reported as income also come back as brackets or reductions of your tax alternative minimum taxable income because you're if you're AMT'd, you get absolutely no benefit from the tax refund deduction. So they're not going to make you pay taxes on the refund. All right, so why is this stuff so hard? Well, just because it is, right? It is tedious, detailed reading that you simply have to roll up your sleeves and break down and do. You have chosen an accounting profession and I guarantee you the detail is not going away. No matter how far up the food chain you get, you've got to be willing to get out your glasses, read word by word and figure out what's going on. So line one is a perfect example of this, right? So we've got all these different references to the Form 1040 that start out with if filing Schedule A, right? And then otherwise would be people who are not filing the Schedule A. So let's take a look at the back of the 1040 at the lines that are being referenced. Remember, we start out on the back with AGI and then 39A and B are just counting how many blind or old bumps you get. And then line 40 is your itemized deductions or your standard deduction, which is ever, ever higher. So in Thelma's case, we are itemizing. So we would start with line 41. So the first thing you should notice and a good potential CPA exam question is nobody gets exemptions and their calculation of alternative, alternative minimum taxable income. And that's actually gone to court. There was, I believe, a Mormon who had several children and all of those deductions for the children were causing the regular tax liability to be reasonable. But he had to pay an AMT tax because when he came back here and had to take away all those exemptions, the AMT was triggered. And so he made a freedom of religion issue. Right. I my Mormonism, it's very important to Mormons to have children because of some religious uh, concepts that they have. And he said, you're penalizing me. And the Supreme, I don't, I don't think it was the Supreme Court. The tax court simply said, you know, religion is one thing. Your tax calculation is another. And we just don't believe they intersect. So you're out of luck. So nobody gets exemptions. And then go to the otherwise. Enter the amount from line 38, which means that nobody gets a standard deduction. So in the calculation of the AMT, both the standard deduction and the exemptions disappear completely. And then what we're going to do is make some adjustments to the itemized deductions. So let's go back up to the top. So once we figured out which line we're starting with, uh, if it is line 41, that means that the itemized deductions adjusted for the high net worth reduction 
are in your total for line one. But note for the line references coming up, they ask you to go straight to the non-adjusted form. So taxes line nine is all the taxes, whether you were rich or not. And so the medical, it tells you to use this 2.5% rule if you were 65 or older. And note the bold, smaller of what you deducted or 2.5% of your AGI. All the taxes come back. The home mortgage interest adjustment. Don't go to that worksheet. That worksheet will drive you crazy because they don't use the term equity interest. What they refer to is mortgage interest that was used to acquire or improve the residence or mortgage interest that was not used. So if you're clear that that's what they're doing, you can use the worksheet. Uh, but we're not going to make life any more complicated than you know which one comes back. I will always label interest as either acquisition or equity. It is the equity interest that comes back. And then your miscellaneous itemized deductions from line 27. So that's not the other. That's just the 2% ones. And then line six refers to whatever adjustment you made on your worksheet for high net worth individuals has to come back as a negative number to drive these numbers down. And they're not trying to do any proration here. Uh, there, you note that there are some items that are not AMT addbacks. It doesn't matter. So you get 100% of whatever that adjustment was applied against these items. Life could be a whole lot messier. And in your tax refund, once again, they're taking a very simple approach here. They don't ask you, uh, they don't try to match the refund with the AMT position. They just say, if for any reason on this year's tax return, you reported a tax refund, add it back as a reduction of the AMT because we are taking away all of your taxes as a deduction for the AMT we're not going to make you report any of the income related to tax refunds. So I know that was a lot. What you need to do is simply read carefully, line by line, what's going on. You'll need to refer to the back of the 1040 and to the Schedule A. So your brain's having to go to three different places. And so it's going to get really tired and confused if you don't go really slowly.